We're continually getting asked in the progressive and unlimited success communities, who inspired Mark and myself? Who were our mentors? Who, when we started out, really helped us grow our property and personal development businesses, our wealth and our relationships with people? We decided to do something I don't think anyone, I've never seen it being done, we've certainly never done it before, which was to, over a period of time, track down many of our mentors and people we really look up to. These people have helped us so much, but because they're either billionaires or worldwide celebrities or some of them non-household names, they're very hard to track down, certainly aren't really always that comfortable with having a camera in their face. But we've done some amazing things and really pulled out the stops for you. So we've got a little bit of a series for you. Yesterday, for me, still in the same clothes, I had an amazing interview with Dr. John Demartini. I'm so excited for you now because you're about to sit in with Mark Homer interviewing Andreas Paniotu. Now, if you're a property investor watching this, you must know who Andreas is. Another person who's been a real mentor and inspiration to Mark and I. We met him actually for the first time five years ago. He gave us some tips on moving into commercial property uh, and that's helped us make many millions of pounds. So I want to say thanks, Andreas. Now, Andreas, uh, nearly 25 years ago, built up a portfolio of what he calls built and developed to lets of 7,000 flats in London. So 7,000 properties in his portfolio. He's the biggest private landlord in the UK at the time. And he sold them all perfect timing before the recession, obviously made uh, many hundreds of millions of pounds. And then like you play Monopoly, he moved up into hotels. So he now has a huge portfolio of hotels. He's a billionaire. Uh, you're gonna love this interview. He also has a private jet company. It costs 200,000 pounds to fill his yacht with petrol. Just thought, <laughs> another level. So uh, I'm really excited for you to sit in an interview with Mark Homer and Andreas Paniotti. Hello, welcome. Mark Homer from Progressive Property. Uh, I'm co-founder with Rob Moore. Um, we've, we've bought, developed, converted over 450 properties. And I'm here today with Andreas Paniotti, who has a, an enviable reputation uh, of being um, one of, if not the biggest residential developer at, at one point or residential investor in the whole country. Um, Andreas, really good to be here with you. Uh, and th thank you for taking the time. Um, how did you first get into property and build your portfolio? Well, it started some 30 years ago. And basically, my parents were in the dry cleaning business. So I left school um, and they had one dry cleaning shop. And basically, I decided to convert the top floor into a one bedroom apartment. But you've got to remember that's like 25, 30 years ago when residential was not a desirable asset class. There was no big portfolios and so on. So I converted it and I made some like 20 or 25,000 pounds. So obviously I like doing that rather than being in the dry cleaners. So then I started hunting around and buying, you know, shops with upper parts, then converting. But the one thing I did was, was not to sell, was to keep for the long term. So over the next 20, 25 years, I was building all around East London, Clark and Well, which is fashionable today, which wasn't then, Islington, Hackney Borders, the city and so on. And we amassed to 7,000 apartments over that whole period. Old colleges, universities, shoe factories, all redundant buildings all over East London. So we built up 7,000 odd apartments, which we was just renting out and not selling. Now, obviously, in that period, as we all know, um, the whole world was on our side. Residential became a desirable class. The funds started getting interested into residential as they could use it as an asset class. The buy-to-let phenomenon come in as well. And then up to about 2006, 2006 2007, is because we were so close to the market on buying, building and letting, we kept that all in-house. We saw yields drop from say 20% all the way down to 3%. And it's at that stage where we was waiting and I was assuming there's going to be a massive crash here. So then I was having a lot of attention from all the funds which were coming in because they wanted big portfolios. And that is when I decided to get out of the residential. Okay, so over kind of the next five years, things have changed a hell of a lot, you know, kind of post-recession. We've got buy to let's back we've got you know commercial which 
probably still coming off a low base and, and a bit more sluggish. Where do you think the next opportunities are over the next five years? In residential specifically or across Residential, these? commercial, across the whole spectrum. Well, residential to me at the moment is, you know, we went through this last recession, which was more of, I would say, more of a depression rather than a recession. Because the only difference in this period, the last five, six years, to what happened, you know, in the depression years, 100 years ago, is this time the governments decide to bow out the banks which didn't happen 100 years ago. So it was more like a, we was heading for a depression. Um, and now you see residential has bounced back, but it's a very false economy. But residential, it depends. Residential sounds like, you know, is it just buy to let? Is it build to let? Is it conversion? The golden rule is you've got to add value. The basic sums, if you look at the maths, base rate is at half a percent. That's the lowest in history. Now, OK, cost of funds could be three, three and a half percent. And people are doing buy to let at five percent yields. Now, unless we believe the base rate is going to stay where it is for years to come, we, we're heading in for another crash in residential in the buy to let. But if you are investing in residential and you are actually creating value, then that will create a bigger buffer for once the interest rates do come back up. A good, I would say, six percent is the right figure to use as an interest payment, and then you should work your yields from there. So if you're buying, refurbing or, or converting or adding value in some way, sweating the asset, yeah. that's probably the thing you need to be doing with, with residential. 100%. Yeah. And actually commercial as well. And commercial. It's any asset class. You've yeah. always got to be adding value. But the buy to let has become such an easy way of getting into residential, let's say. Yeah. You know, so it's making you know, people's lives very easy to get into it, but I don't think they're really understanding you know, how will it look in three, four years' time? Yeah. Okay, so what would you kind of, how would you compare residential with commercial now? You know, what are, what are the, the main differences? I know commercial is a lot more difficult to get into, but how are they different? Well, personally, I think, you know, if we're, if we're looking at pure investment, if you compare residential to, say, commercial, office buildings, let's say, I would say the office buildings are more, uh, is a safer bet. If you've got a long-term tenant, 15, 20 years, a good covenant, you're pretty secure for that period. But there again, what are you buying in at? What, what yield are you buying in at today compared to where interest rates could go or cost of funds could go? So there again, unless you're buying commercial and you're adding value, it's the same thing as residential. And I suppose, you know, London and the rest of the UK, there's still, you know, a big divide in terms of capital values. Where do you see the kind of differing levels of growth between those two? Has London had a, a good run and maybe the growth will spread to the rest of the country and, and there'll be some catch up or do you not see it that way? When you always look at, you know, once you've gone through a recession and let's say, you know, you're getting into property in any of the asset classes, you should always be looking at what dropped the most throughout the recession because that will come back the fastest. You'll get a big, much bigger return. As far as London is concerned, London is a bubble where it is what it is and yields are, you know, they're two, three percent. It's, where's that going to go? But outside London, there's a lot of areas, as long as we're talking residential, as long as you're near train stations, city centres, you've got big footfall, they're the areas to really get into in residential because you want to have a further growth. So we're in Luton at the moment. Yes. That's a little bit further out of London. That might be one of those areas. Rob and I are in Peterborough. Those, those kind of satellite towns that are outside of the M25, that's probably a better area to be, maybe the Midlands. Of course, if you, wanna, if you really want to make a real investment. You know, London, as far as residential is concerned, it's, not re it's a long-term investment. If we said something in London, you know, let's say in the West End, it's 2 3% today. If you keep it 20 years, and then look back, capital appreciation will give you a kind of 6% IRR. But if you go into these areas outside of London, you'll see that return a lot quicker. And what have been your biggest challenges amassing your kind of wealth through property? Biggest challenges? Mm. Um, what are the biggest challenges? Well, throughout the recession, obviously, the way the banking world was and the finance was, where banks um, changed their attitude, they had their own internal problems, and the banks are a business as well. They found themselves on the verge of bankruptcy. 
So obviously all the, um, the attitude changed, scrutiny on your assets changed, so it was a difficult period. And in terms of the not quite achievers versus the kind of big achievers, obviously there's usually quite a fine line. Um, do, you, do you have any views as to what separates those two sets of people? What do the big achievers do that the not so achievers didn't do? Well, it's a combination of it. It's quite a combination of a lot of things. It's all about focus and how much effort you put into your business. The golden rule is if you ask yourself, do I put 100% in my business? If the answer is no, that is where, where the issue is. So it's about focus and you get some people that work. It's not about working hard, it's about focusing and always sharpening the knife, not becoming complacent. And never really, is, for me, it's always every day is the beginning of my new business. I never dwell on the past. And you've got to keep on moving forward, keep on you know, trying to understand the business, trying to find ways. Everyone is always learning. But the problem is you get a lot of guys that, you know, a lot of people that achieve something and then they sit back and think, well, I've achieved it. For other people, it's not good enough. You have to keep on every day, you need to be sharpening the knife and really learning more about your business. When do you think the next crash will happen? And are we in a bubble now? I think as, as far as because of where base, you know, the base rate is, I keep on talking about this base rate because it's fundamental. Um, we've got issues with Europe that's still not been finalised. So I think, where are we? It's hard to say, but I think we're just coming back and getting a bit of normality into the property, you know, the property world. So I think we're going to have a good four, five, six years of growth still to come. And then I think we're going to just see corrections rather than, a, you know, a boom and bust scenario that we've seen. And, you know, you're supremely fit, you know, you, you live very well, you're you know, very much into your diet, fitness, you know, what other kind of daily habits, daily traits would you kind of have that you could recommend to, to other people to, to mirror your success? Well, it's all about, you have to be disciplined. It depends how much you want. And what you actually find is the more you achieve, the more vulnerable you feel. One thing is achieving it and second is how to keep it. So the more assets you own and the more responsibility, you know, we employ 4,000 staff across all our hotels. So it's a big responsibility. So for me, it's about being, um, you know, you've got to be on your business. You've got to be, you know, on it from morning to night. You can't just, you know, fluff through your business. So it's, it's all about focus and just breathing it and living it. And if you kind of had to start again, you know, you're right back at the beginning, you'd lost all your cash and, you know, you needed to get onto the first rung to grow your wealth again. Where would, what would you do? Where would you, where would you be? Where would I be? I would just look at all the asset classes and see where, depending on what money I had, because you need some sort of money to start. Um, but it's where you can add value. There's no easy way in the property industry. At the moment, it sounds easy with all this buy to let and, and so on, but it's about adding value. You know, I'd look at residential, I'd look at, you know, different classes like that, where I can build or add something to the asset. Because that's where the real profit is. And sustainable profit for the future. You've got to be adding value. Okay, and I know when you started, you, you grew your balance sheet very quickly and, and bought a, a lot of buildings very, very quickly. How did you do that? Did you JV with people? Did you get other investors on the... How did you kind of... Well, it started very small, but obviously, well, like I said, we had the, the world was on our side. Residential was becoming desirable. Banks were throwing money at people. It was, it was doing something at the right time. Now, what I did 25 years ago is what people are trying to achieve today, but it's a different world. You know, if you look at it, you know, a lot of property assets or residential, let's say, you know, the guys today are adding in their profit margins when they're selling the land or the building. You know, them days it was, you know, in East London there was redundant schools, redundant um, factories where people didn't even know what to do with the buildings. They were happy just like literally to give it to you, give it away. So it's, it's a lot more difficult today to start again. Um, but I still think there is opportunities.